When I was made fun of growing up, overall, I kept it inside. Can I start the French toast? It's embarrassing to tell people you love that this is happening to you, want them to know that you are a success. How's your stomach, Mom? Fine. But this rage grows in you. I remember at age 12 or 13, leaving my bedroom just to yell at mom. I was so mad at her because of all people, a mother should get the angst I was going through being Asian in a white family in a white community. I personally thought you fit in quite well. You had a lot of friends. They all loved you. You were always busy. Mom, I didn't fit in. On the bus, um, the most popular boy in school would sit behind me and taunt me and tell all the kids on the bus he could blindfold me with dental floss all through junior high. But you never shared those with us. And even if I tried to talk with you about it, you pretty much didn't want to talk about it. And I thought, well... Maybe she's handling it her way, or maybe she just isn't ready to handle it or face it. I think it's um, a, a lot of responsibility for um, that little kid to explain. No, I don't want to learn about my Korean heritage because at school I get teased for being Korean. And... Um, right now, I want to be as little Korean as possible. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be like everybody else I see around me. You know, when you were about 12, you wanted to have surgery on your eyes to make them round. Yep, and I was going to bleach my hair blonde. <laughs> and... To get my hair blonde would take so much bleaching. Get contact lenses Hopefully that are blue. Out. But listen, <laughs> Mom, it's not funny. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't think it's funny. When I hear that now, my heart hurts for that little girl because I remember that feeling, and I think of the, the self-loathing that happens because I wanted to be white so bad, and I wanted to not be who I was so bad. I mean... I say that I'm an Asian woman and I want you to see me as an Asian daughter because you can't separate my race from me. Basically, all of you know, 2004 was spent on fertility treatments. And by the time that year was up and the insurance company was actually telling me, you know, you've done enough, um, I started getting to the you know, stage of, you know, what is the next step? How are we still going to have a family? I think there's a lot of reasons that people end up going into adoption. And I think that it's really helpful for people to acknowledge, I want this child. I want this for me, for my family. And that doesn't mean that I'm doing something that's bad in the world or hurtful to people. It just means that I also recognize that I have an investment in this and that I'm getting something that I need. It was primarily selfish because I wanted to be a mother, period. We needed to be a family, in my mind. That's why. It didn't have anything to do with providing a home for a little lost soul. It was about... Me. When people wonder about what selfish means in terms of adoption, I think they tend to take a very um, limited perspective of what that term means. They think of selfish as good or bad. Any words, they, they sort of look at it as a pejorative um, kind of term that's used to describe someone who's doing something bad and that no one would ever want to be described as selfish. And the difficulty with doing that is that whenever we try and resist real terms that really do describe what we're doing. We've also decided to deny parts of, of our feelings and our, our hopes, our dreams, our actions, all of those things. That she has changed my life in millions of ways and all for the better. Uh, so in that way, you know, perhaps selfish, 
but but it's a mutually beneficial relationship uh, that I think, and it's love. I mean, it's it's a genuine love. I I can't imagine that that there's a um, a criticism of that. Everybody in adoption, whether it be the birth parent, the child, or the adoptive family, they're all suffering a loss through this process. And it's, people think it's such a joyful process, and they um, want it to be a happy process. And we try to educate them that it will, but it's not without its issues and that they're just inherent in the process of becoming a family through adoption. No adoption story has a happy beginning, you know? Kids don't get adopted if everything is going real well in their birth family. And it's amazing how young some kids are when they have some kind of awareness of that. They come to me with a story that I don't know. I have to own that. I have to help them own that. I have to tell them it's okay to hurt over it, and it's okay not to. So many people think of grief as a bad thing and that nothing could be further from the truth. Grief is an incredibly complex experience, a complex feeling. Um, there's anger, there's loss, there's fear, there's anxiety, and sometimes there's even a mellow sadness um, that people experience when they go through grief. So it's, it's very complex and it's developmental. It doesn't happen all at once. It kind of unfolds in a natural progression. Teach me, you know, show me. I'm willing to learn. I, I'm not going to turn to a critic that, that says things to me like, you know, you are a white woman and you don't know anything about race to be defensive about it because you're right. I am a white woman. I, don't, I didn't have to deal with race growing up. I had to deal with a lot of things, but race wasn't one of those. If the parent hasn't dealt with race, and by dealt I mean if they don't admit that prejudice and discrimination exists, the impact of that is that if and when their children experience it, they're going to minimize it and they're going to deny it. And when parents minimize the children's experiences of prejudice and discrimination, the children begin to believe that there must be something wrong with me. Parents have to understand how to become allies. And when I say allies, that means it is not okay for white parents to say, oh, I'm sure Mrs. So-and-so didn't really mean it that way. It is not okay to excuse racism. Racism is a personal attack on people. And as white parents, because we do look like the perpetrator of racism very often, we absolutely have to make sure our kids can believe that we have their back. And that starts by believing them. It always surprised me when I looked in the mirror. The ongoing joke with my friends now is that I'm like an Asian denial, that when I look in the mirror, it surprises me, like, oh my god, I'm not white. I do think that uh, when I was younger, that there was a way that because my parents were white, that I was afforded certain privileges that um, I wouldn't have been afforded if I came from a black family. Um, I think that I was able to go places and do things and see things that I wouldn't have had access to otherwise. Well, even if you give them your privileges, the fine education, the monetary benefits, uh, the status, the fact still remains that when they are not with you, they're still vulnerable to the same type of treatments that other people in their, in their minority group are going to experience. I think the hardest part about being different is um, not having the acceptance that everyone naturally has. That, like, if I were a Caucasian person walking into Plainview, I think that people wouldn't necessarily look twice. And if they said that they were Jewish, they would accept it right away, rather than second-guessing me. 
I think that's the hardest part. I think that I, I want to be accepted, and I don't always get that right away. I have to work for it, and I always have. I do remember people asking me, is that your brother, and nobody believing me. And people would come up and say, oh, where did you get these girls? Where did they come from? Are they really sisters? How much did you pay for that yeah. child? Or, you know, In how China. Much, they'll ask yeah. you, it, yeah, what, you know, they'll ask you what your income level is. What we consider to be really intrusive questions. It's just out there, you know, above no. board and a matter for public discussion. You may not be able to believe that people really do ask these kinds of questions. But be prepared. These questions can annoy you because they seem ignorant. But there are other kinds of questions that can give you pause because they come from people who are informed about global politics and socioeconomic reform. These questions may be the most difficult for you because they reveal just how complicated international adoption can be.